Conflict is the norm in the animal kingdom. Evolution via natural selection is survival of the fittest, where fitness is defined as an individual's reproductive success. In the struggle for existence, only those organisms that are well adapted to their environment pass on their genes, which in turn become more prevalent over time. In this sense, organisms are survival machines designed by natural selection to maximise their own reproductive success. In order to survive and reproduce, an animal must exploit resources in its environment. But the most valuable resources are often other living organisms, which also have an interest in maximising their own fitness. Thus, there is always a potential conflict of interest between any two organisms who are genetically unrelated. The prey does not want to be devoured by the predator, the host does not want to be infected by the parasite, and the female does not want to be inseminated by the unattractive male. From an evolutionary perspective, altruism, behaviour that benefits another at the expense of oneself, thus presents a paradox. How could pro-social behaviour evolve in a world characterised by conflicts of interest? This paradox is easy to resolve by expanding the definition of reproductive success to include not just personal fitness, but inclusive fitness that is, all of the offspring produced by an individual and their relatives. Redefined, altruism within a family or kin group makes evolutionary sense because the individuals share many of the same genes. Thus, by sacrificing for one another, they are in effect helping to propagate their own genes. J.B.S. Haldane summarised the logic of kin selection when he said that he would lay down his life for two brothers or eight cousins. But the logic of cooperation can be extended even to individuals who are unrelated. Specifically, pro-social behaviour can be expected to emerge whenever the long-term benefits to fitness outweigh the short-term costs. In a one-off encounter, exploitation is the norm. But over the course of a lifetime, individuals who engage in reciprocal altruism by returning favours will do better than those who act selfishly. This is especially true for longer-lived species where offspring require high amounts of parental investment. Thus, among our early ancestors, group members who shared resources and cared for one another's children outreproduced those that were less cooperative. The importance of cooperation in our evolutionary past is evidenced by the so-called social emotions, the origins of which can be traced back to the emergence of mammals over 200 million years ago. Maternal care was the first instance of altruism in our lineage, and it was facilitated by strong feelings of love and affection. Once attachment bonds had developed, the positive emotions associated with the mother-infant diet could then be transferred to other close relatives, which allowed our primate ancestors to band together in groups. With the advent of group living, social affiliation itself became a form of pleasure and isolation a form of pain. The emotions of pride and shame corresponded with social inclusion and exclusion, motivating our ancestors to seek the former and avoid the latter. An awareness of social status, in turn, set the stage for less nepotistic forms of altruism to emerge, since a good reputation could be earned through pro-social behaviour and free-riding could be effectively punished by ostracism. Fraternal feelings allowed unrelated individuals to form reciprocal partnerships, whilst indignation protected against exploitation by non-reciprocators. Once coalitions between non-relatives emerged, Less direct forms of reciprocity could spread rapidly through social learning, as other group members observed the benefits of cooperation. Eventually, in humans with symbolic language, pro-social and antisocial behaviour were codified in systems of morality, which tended to encourage indiscriminate altruism towards members of one's own tribe. The basic formula of moral systems, in-group altruism combined with out-group hostility, 
suggests that they evolved in response to competition between groups. In other words, we cooperate to compete. After the invention of agriculture, intergroup competition intensified as population density increased and arable land became the most valuable resource. The ability to control resources and accumulate wealth shifted the dynamic of power between the sexes. Since males had always competed among themselves for access to females, in agricultural societies, owning the means of production became the means to reproduction. Female mate selection was recalibrated towards male resource potential rather than just good genes. In turn, fathers demanded certainty over the paternity of offspring who stood to inherit their property. Thus, unlike matriarchal systems of morality that encouraged female promiscuity, patriarchal systems of morality emphasised female chastity and fidelity. Patrilineal inheritance biased parental investment towards sons, since daughters were expected to leave their family of origin and join their husband's community. Patrilocal marriage and the payment of a dowry to a wife's husband reinforced the dominant position of males in agricultural societies. The sexual division of labour was also intensified by sedentary living and food surpluses. Faced with the threat of raids and warfare, territorial defence by men became essential to a group's survival. With a surplus of calories, a woman's most valuable contribution to her group was no longer the food she gathered, but the children she reared. The sexual division of labour was even more extreme in pastoral societies, where the domestication of animals combined with a nomadic lifestyle allowed men to focus exclusively on raiding and pillaging, whilst accumulating harems of captured women. It's not a coincidence that the most patriarchal cultures the Arabs and the Mongols, emerged from groups of nomadic pastoralists. According to the Arab historian Ibn Khaldun, the harsh conditions of the desert and the steppe produced tight-knit paternal clans whose group solidarity, Asabiya, was unrivaled. Their morality was the Nietzschean ideal that man shall be trained for war and woman for the procreation of the warrior. The evolutionary success of this moral system can be seen in the genetic legacies of its most virile proponents. Sultan Moulay Ismail famously sired 888 children in his lifetime. Whilst an estimated 16 million men living today are descendants of Genghis Khan. According to the founder of Clio Dynamics, Peter Turchin, the competition between male-dominated agricultural and pastoral societies underpinned the rise of civilization. Throughout history, the most powerful empires have all emerged from meta-ethnic frontiers, boundaries where major ethnic groups came into contact. Intense conflict between groups selected for ever more cooperation within them. Indeed, the mere presence of a frontier breeds solidarity and unity. To the members of one's own tribe, outsiders are always the enemy at the gates, barbarians, less than human. Over time, the most altruistic groups, that is, those with the highest internal capacity for self-sacrifice and collective action, forged their own nations in the crucible of intergroup competition. From the perspective of group selection, the old lie is true, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. During times of war, we see the importance of kinship metaphors in propaganda. Invariably, soldiers are a band of brothers fighting to protect their fatherland. For our ancient ancestors, this was literally true. What distinguished the patrician from the plebeian was not merely having a noble father, but tracing one's descent through a male lineage back to the founding fathers of the nation. Fittingly, the legitimate source of all patriarchal authority was summarised in the Roman formula Protego ergo obligo, I protect, therefore I obligate. This principle underpins the sex contract between husband and wife, as well as the social contract between state and citizen. In the first case, a woman submits to her husband and guarantees sexual exclusivity, 
because he protects and provides for her. In much the same way, the loyalty of a man to his kingdom or nation-state is contingent on its ability to protect him from external threats. The mutual relation between protection and obedience highlights that, contrary to popular opinion, the age of patriarchy was in fact the height of human cooperation. Under the auspices of the patricians, even the mating conflict between males and females was suppressed for the benefit of the republic. Whilst competition between groups weaves a close-knit honour culture, competition within them unravels the social fabric. The historian John Glubb noted that an increase in the influence of women in public life has often been associated with national decline. In the crucible of war, it is clearly understood that feminine behaviour and liberal values have to be curtailed for a civilization to survive. But the military success of an empire creates the conditions for its eventual downfall. As the imperial borders expand and warfare is limited to distant outposts, life in the metropolitan areas becomes increasingly decadent. With growing wealth and luxury, masculine virtues give way to feminine vice. As a way of life, heroic self-sacrifice is replaced by hedonistic consumption bread and circuses. Group solidarity is undermined by competition within the elite class. Instead of unifying the masses through their moral leadership, the nobility try to outdo one another in virtue signalling and public displays of wealth. And of course, in a culture of honour, where manliness is the true origin of virtue, nothing erodes fighting spirit more than female licentiousness. Speaking in defence of the Let's Opia, Cato the Elder said, It is because we have not kept them under control individually that we are now terrorised by them collectively. Our ancestors refused to allow any woman to transact even private business without a guardian to represent her. Women had to be under the control of fathers, brothers or husbands. Woman is a violent and uncontrolled animal and it is useless to let go the reins and then expect her to not kick over the traces. You must keep her on a tight rein. Suffer women once to arrive at an equality with you, and they will from that moment become your masters.